there are really only two things that are gonna help your anxiety long term, and neither of those are avoidance. I think we all know how uncomfortable anxiety can be, right? I mean, it's a full body experience because it's our body's response to danger. So there's a lot of warning systems going on. A lot of systems come online to help protect us and to keep us safe. If anyone has ever told you anxiety is all in your head, they're just wrong. Yes, our thoughts play a major role in the anxiety that we can experience, but that doesn't mean that that's the only thing going on. We feel anxiety when our brain and our nervous system feel threatened. This can be a very real threat or it can be a perceived threat. Our thoughts can and often do lead to the anxiety that we experience because our nervous system can respond to our thoughts in those worst case scenarios as if they are actually happening. But anyway, it's only natural that when we feel this anxious discomfort, we want it to stop immediately, which is where avoidance typically comes into play. Now, back in the day, avoidance was kind of an advantageous response, right? I mean, it makes sense that if we are to avoid actual dangers, that's going to help us stay safe and alive longer. The problem with avoidance in our current present day society is that many of our anxiety triggers and our fears are not actual life-threatening dangers to us. And I say that with a whole lot of love because it does feel like they are life-threatening at the time, but if we're super honest with ourselves, they're not going to lead to any sort of bodily harm. Instead, our fears are things like speaking to another human being or taking a test, giving a presentation, even walking down the streets wearing shorts that maybe are a little bit shorter than you're comfortable with. That's not to say that these are trivial fears by any means. They can and often do elicit a lot of extreme anxiety for us. The thing is, when we avoid things like this that do elicit that anxiety but aren't necessarily actually life-threatening, we are essentially sending a signal to our brain that says, yep, this is super dangerous for us. And then the next time that that trigger comes up for us, our body is going to ramp up our protective response, which means we're gonna experience more anxiety, not less. Now, on the flip side of that, when we acknowledge that there is a fear of ours that we've maybe been avoiding, but it's not life-threatening to us, and we decide to intentionally face that fear and breathe through that anxious discomfort until it passes, and it will pass once our brain and our nervous system realize that we aren't in any danger. When we do this, this can lead to freedom from anxiety. This can lessen our anxious protective response in the long run, the more that we do this. Because when we face these fears intentionally and we breathe through that discomfort, that teaches our brain or sends the signal to our brain that, okay, we survived this thing. Yes, maybe it was uncomfortable, but I survived. And because I survived, now I get the signal that this was not as dangerous as I thought that it was. And so when we come up against that same or similar situation or fear in the future, our body's going to remember that, hey, we survived last time. So we don't need to send out as much of an anxious response as we did then. And the more that we do this over time, our anxiety will lessen. So facing our fears is one of the primary ways that we can decrease our anxiety long term, which essentially is the opposite of avoidance. <laughs> The other way of getting some long-term relief from anxiety is by bringing intentional calming activities into our everyday life, even if we're not feeling anxious. I personally like to call this cultivating a calm. And when I'm working with clients, we kind of create our very own personalized calm plan. You can start your own calm plan if you want, really by just starting to write down a list of all of the people, places, activities, anything that brings you into a state of feeling calm, peaceful, joy or relaxation. Once you have that list and maybe after adding in a few intentional breathing strategies, you get to decide when would be most realistic during your day and week to incorporate some of these calming activities. As a general rule of thumb, I like to have maybe one to three like larger scale activities throughout the week and then maybe one to two smaller activities during the day. Ultimately, we just don't want this to feel super overwhelming. We just want to have an intentional plan of, okay, I can kind of rely on, I'm going to meet my friend for coffee on Friday morning or Saturday morning or whatever it is. And then something that we can look forward to, it's planned, it's scheduled, and I know that that's going to bring some enjoyment and peace to my life. Whereas on a 
a daily basis. Maybe it's going through a meditation or practicing yoga or maybe going through a few rounds of a breathwork type practice in the morning or in the evening before we go to bed. If you want a little more guidance with this whole calm plan thing, download my free calm guide. I will leave a link for that down in the description.